Giving an Ass is a show dedicated to defending the historic Christian faith. Today the topic is how to develop good philosophy in the church. This is actually a continuation from uh, another topic that I had with the same guests and that was discussing bad philosophy and why Christians should care about philosophy in the church. We talked about why there's bad philosophy, now we're going to try to talk about the solution which is good philosophy and how to actually bring that into the church and my guest is Jason Reed. Jason Reed has an undergraduate in philosophy from Iowa State University, a master's in apologetics from Southern Evangelical Seminary, a doctrinal candidate at St. Louis University, and he's professor of philosophy currently at Southern Evangelical Seminary. He's actually been a philosophy instructor of a class that I took metaphysics and uh, Wow, I don't even want to think about it. Right that was now. a deep end in the pool. Yes, very deep end. <laughs> did I leave out anything? No, that sounds great. I did leave out something. What's uh, that? Aren't you married? Oh, yeah, my family. <laughs> See, I'm trying to help hope, you. Hope, hope my wife isn't I, watching. I'm trying to help you out here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've been, uh, I've been happily married for eight years. I think my wife has been happily married. Okay. I know I've been happily married for eight years to so Holly Reed. Um, we have three girls. Uh, Lisa is five. Genevieve is three. Uh, Mary is six months. And uh, we just moved to Charlotte a couple months ago to be, like you said, to take the professor of philosophy at Southern Evangelical Seminary. I am working on my dissertation currently at St. Louis University and uh, teaching courses there at the seminary uh, in the fall and in the spring and just uh, got on full time. So we're excited. Last time we talked about bad philosophy in the church and we talked about, for instance, like relativism and pluralism. Mm -hmm. They've actually infiltrated the church and people mm -hmm. don't realize that it's philosophy. A lot of Christians would say, well, we shouldn't do philosophy. What they, what they don't realize is that they are doing philosophy. That's right. They're just doing bad philosophy and, and you pointed that out last week. So today we're going to try to talk about, you know, how to rectify that. And okay. The first question I have for you is, what is the relationship now between philosophy and apologetics? You know, I love apologetics. That's, I'm a, you know, I'm an apologist. That's what I do. That's what I do for a living. So what's the relationship now between philosophy and apologetics? Okay, well, this is a good question. This is a good segue into the answer to this topic. Um, how are we going to get good philosophy in the church? It's a practical question. And what we're proposing in this, episode, in this show is that apologetics is going to be one of the main ways in which we can get good philosophy in the church. So let's look at this. Let's look at philosophy and apologetics. Philosophy, as we said last time, is um, the love of wisdom. It begins in wonder. Um, it begins in uh, a a childlike curiosity, you know, what's the world about? You know, is there a God? You know, look out to the up in the sky. Is all there is all that's out there the stars, or is there something more? Um, you think about the whole history of the universe, and what are we? We're just a blimp on the screen. Is that all we are, or is there more to life than that? So philosophy begins there. We ask these big, big questions about: Is there a God? Is there meaning? Is there life after death, and so on? Okay, apologetics. Um, is a branch of Christian theology that seeks to give a rational, emphasis on rational, demonstration of the truth claims that Christians make. The Christian church says this, it is true that God exists. It is true that the kind of God exists as a creator. It is true that the Bible is the word of God. It is true that Jesus Christ is the son of God. It is true that God has acted in the world in in the miraculous, has acted miraculously in space-time. The question becomes, why think that those claims are true? Why think that it's true that God exists? Why think that it is true that Jesus Christ rose from, the, rose from the dead as the unique son of God? And so on. Apologetics says, we've got answers. And we're going to give you reasons. I'm not, I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm not going to give you some type of, just, it's just my view. Well, there's evidence. We've got reason for it. And so it's a heavy emphasis on the rational. What's the relationship between the two is that apologetics and philosophy are rational inquiries. Namely, that they're, we're trying to say that this is objective. You can test it out for yourself. And so the relationship being is that the apologist is going to use the tools of philosophy to make those demonstrations. You just reminded me of something. That's why I was smiling here. I, okay. I gave a talk last week, and my father was there. And it was mm -hmm. a talk on the deity of Christ, you know, proving the deity of Christ. And my father was there, and he was, you know, he was listening to it. And then later on that evening, he said to me, he said, uh, because one of the things I talked about was the fact that if Christianity is true, then the religions that differ from it must be false. So, like, if Christianity says that Jesus was crucified and Islam says that Jesus wasn't crucified, then Islam must be wrong on that point. And so my father, he said, he looked at me, he said, you don't, you're not interested in being politically correct, are you? 
<laughs> I said, Dad, the truth is not politically correct. <laughs> because the point, you know, like, and that's what you're saying. Which I, as apologists, I'm saying this is true. You know, that's right. I'm not trying to be your buddy. I'm not trying to be your friend. I'm just trying to share truth with you. You know, you can accept it or you can reject it, but I'm not here to try to make people, I, I'm here to share the truth. And that's, 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 what, that's what apologetics is all about. Now, talking about apologetics, a lot of people out there, lay people in the churches, you know, they, they just don't know how to use apologetics practically in the church. How can, they, how can someone who's in the church, a lay person in the church, use apologetics effectively? I think the, one of the real practical ways in which you can use apologetics um, is to think about the kinds of questions that non-believers ask, or even Christians ask. Um, for example, um, one, of the, one of the ways in which I got involved in apologetics was people had questions, and they want answers. And so, what do you do? You start to invest investigate these answers. Find out on the street what's, what's, um, what the people are thinking. Um, go around, like what I, what I did when I was in, at the university, I went around campus with a questionnaire and asked people, so what do you think about God? What do you think about religion? What do you think about these things? So you can go um, try to just try to make the people on the street you can ask um, your coworker. Let me ask you this question, okay? You'd be interrogative, kind of like a little Socrates, or you know, um, if you ever read Plato, um, Socrates is like this little gadfly. He's always asking people questions. You can do that as an as a, an apologist to get started. Um, find out what kind of questions you're asking. Go to your coworker. Let me ask you this question: um, Do you think Christianity is true? What are some of the questions that you have? Um, what, what, would, what would convince you, what would it take to convince you that, you that Christianity was true, and so on. So that, that's a practical thing. Start going through and finding what the kind of questions that people ask, and then try to find the answers. And then provide those answers to the people that are in, you know, on your street, in your, at work, in your family. Well, here's another thing. I, uh, I gave a talk, and the, the pastor did not seem to believe that apologetics was necessary. I mean, his viewpoint was that if you just show the love of Christ, then people will come to be a Christian. You didn't have to get up and defend the faith. You didn't have to prove the existence of God. You didn't have to prove the de deity of, of Jesus. As a matter of fact, another, another gentleman at the same talk I was giving was like, well, you know what, well, I, was, I, was, you know, I was born again when I heard Billy Graham make a call, you know, altar call, and, and, and I knew it was true, and that's all I needed. I didn't need all this faith and all this evidence. Okay. How would you respond to someone um, like that? Was this, was this a pastor you were talking to or your pastor? Well, I don't want to say. <laughs> okay, okay. A <laughs> uh, pastor. A uh, pastor. Okay. A uh, pastor. Okay. Um, is your pastor, is this pastor <laughs> um, Mormon? No. Well, that's odd because the, the, all these reasons that he just gave me are Mormon reasons. And so um, if I said to, you know, what I do in my apologetics classes is I have a scenario where I, ha I use the following terms. There's an evangelist, there's the word of God, and there's a non-believer. And during the dialogue, I use these sort of terms. The evangelist says to the non-believer, um, you need to believe in Jesus Christ. And then the non-believer says, oh, I see that you love Jesus, and I see that you really care about us, and that's made a difference in your life. I'll give my life. And I ask the students, is this a great way of witnessing? And I'm really, I mean, I'm really, you know, abridging it. Um, oh yeah, it's a great way. You show people that, you know, that God loves them and that He's made a difference in your life and show the love of Christ. Mm. Um, they're going to give their lives to it. I said, you just became a Mormon. Now, why doesn't this work? Because the problem with this approach, the idea of saying that, you know, just show the love of Christ, presupposes, that means assumes, lots of things. Namely, that you've got the answer. It assumes that your Jesus is the right Jesus. It assumes that, I mean, because how many Jesuses are there? Lots of different. Which right, one? Right. Is it the Archangel Michael? Is that, is that the kind of Jesus I should believe in? Is it the prophet in Islam? Is it um, the son of Lucifer in Mormonism? Okay, I mean, this idea to show the love of Jesus is a non-Christian way of witnessing. It really is. I don't know if you remember this, but I was sitting in your office last week, and you were I, talking. I, I remember it. Okay, you were talking. I was about, there. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot. <laughs> you were talking about what university you were at, and you were talking about these these two Hindu guys, who I guess it was on a tennis team or something. You were saying about that, and you were saying that they put the Christians the same. They were they were more Christ-like than the Christians were. But your point being, your point was that if a person was just looking at you know these two people, 
then they would, may have become a Hindu. But that doesn't make Hinduism true. That's right. I mean, it's, it is true that Christianity should make a difference. It is true that Jesus said, they will know that you are one of my, you know, they will know you as a follower of mine because you love each other. Those things are true, okay? But questions are going to be asked. Question be asked, well, what happens if the church isn't following Jesus in the right way? Because you and I both know that we, you know, we're Christians, we fail. Yeah, you get that right. You know, we, we don't claim to be perfect. We just claim to point you to the perfect and so on. Here's another thing people have told me. <laughs> yeah. They would say, sure. They would say, well, Harold, you know, you, you know, you've had this formal training in oh, apologetics. Right. And, you know, you, you know, you've sat under these great guys. And, but what about me? You know, I haven't had this formal, tra formal, formal training. How am I supposed to go out and witness the people? Because, because what happens is, what I found is that a lot of Christians don't witness because they are afraid that the person will ask them a question. Because they're afraid that the person may say, why should I believe in Jesus? Why should I believe in Buddha? Why should I believe the Bible? Wasn't the Bible made up? Why should I believe that there's a God anyway? So, so what Satan has done is he has taken the Christians basically off of the battlefield because they're afraid to get on the battlefield because they're afraid to get into the battle. So how would a Christian who doesn't have the formal training get involved? I mean, how, what, what can they do? Okay, well, for, first, uh, first of all, I want to say that um, some people think, I, even if there is formal training, that the, kind of the first assumption they make is formal training and apologetics, all this stuff is for the intellectual. It's for the pastor. It's for the professor. Okay, it's for those sorts of people. Those people can get it, I can't. Well, um, let me tell you a little bit about my intellectual journey. Um, one of the objections I get um, from the everyday person is, um, well, sure, Professor Reed, I mean, look at you. You Look at all the training that you've gotten. It's like we were talking about. You know, you've studied under great minds, and you've studied all these things. I can't begin to do that, you know? So what's a person like me supposed to do? It's very daunting, okay? Well, when I became a Christian back in 1992, um, I had read two books in my lifetime. And one was a Spider-Man comic book. I was in remedial math in second grade. I got held back in second grade. Um, if you'd see me back, you know, 20 years ago, I was anything but an intellectual. But I had a curiosity. When I, after I became a Christian, I either had a, I had a choice to make. If I'm going to witness and be a light to the world, I've got to answer these questions. I've got to be able to answer them for myself, because you know, I've got people, you know, twi I've got Mormons twisting me in knots, Jehovah's Witnesses test twisting me in knots, I've got skeptics twisting me in knots. You know, I don't like being twisted in knots. Okay, it makes you ineffective. I've got to get answers to these. So I just started to read. So one of the ways to get formal training, first of all, you've got to believe that you can get it. You've got to believe that you can get it. I taught at a Bible college up in the Midwest with um, people who had become Christians late in life, they had maybe had high, um, high school, the, the, the highest level of education they had was a sophomore year in high school, and I taught them apologetics. All you need to do apologetics, to get involved in formal training, um, is to have a curiosity, a love for the Lord, and a hard work, and tough, uh, hard work ethic. That's what you need. What do you do in the meantime? I don't have any formal training. There are conferences. You go to these conferences. You, you, you really have to make a commitment to apologetics. There are lots of great resources out there. Go on the website and type in Christian apologetics. Find out there are lectures online. There are beginner's books. Um, when Skeptics Asked by Dr. Norman Geisler. Um, Living Loud by Geisler and Holden. Um, tons of resources you can get that puts the cookies on the bottom shelf and begin there. And that kind of give you an appetite for it. And then go to these conferences. Meet these people. And, uh, I guess that's the answer. You got to right. find it. You got to go where the answers are, and go where you can get the kind of training. If you can't get there, there's also the internet. So that's what I would do. And that's also, what I did. And also, we're commanded to do apologetics because we're commanded, First Peter three fifteen, to always give an answer to anyone who asks us to give the reason for the hope that we have. That's what this show is named after. Right. First Peter three fifteen. So it's not an option. Paul didn't say you should. You know, give an answer. Paul said, you know, it's, it's, it was a command. We we must give an answer. Yeah. Paul didn't say. Um, you know, if, if it's your spiritual gift, right. give an answer. Right. He didn't say, wait until you get your PhD, again, answer. He didn't say, um, here's a nice idea, here's a suggestion, if you feel like it. No, he's, it's in the imperative. Always be ready to give a defense. Um, first Corinthians, second Corinthians 10 and 5, we demolish arguments. Um, 
Paul, over and over again, is reasoning and demonstrated from the scriptures. Jude 3 says, contend for the faith. These are all in the imperative. It's a command to go give apologetics. So whether you like it or not, um, you're commanded to. So it's not an option. That's, tr that's right. Now, fortunately, very few churches teach apologetics. Very few churches have apologetic program that mm -hmm. teaches Christians how to defend their faith, even though we're commanded to do that. Right. How can we convince the church leadership that they need to take you know, an active role in this type of stuff? Right. I think the resistance to apologetics in the church bases, is it based upon a confusion. There's a confusion between what's most important and how do you get to the most important. As an apologist and as a professor of philosophy and apologetics, I would agree that the most important thing there is is loving Jesus and giving your life to Him. Having faith in God is the most important thing. But don't confuse the most important thing with getting there. And one of the uh, good analogy is courtship, being married. The most important thing in my, my relationship to my wife is my love for her. Am I caring for her? having faith in her and so on. But if I went up to her and said um, all these great important things to her and she had never known me before, she would probably say I was some weirdo. Who, who are, what are you saying? Don't you understand? I love you, right. right? This is the most important thing there is. Well, sure, but in order, to, in order to know whether or not something is the most important, you've got a reason to it. And so when churches start to realize, yes, that, that there is room for um, faith in Jesus, love in Jesus, that the relationship that we have as an apologist is that we give support and we try to lead people to the most important. Just like the only way for me to convince my wife that I really love her is to give her evidence that I, that I love her, that I truly would commit myself to her. You know, um, Same thing with the non-believer. The most important thing is to love for Jesus, but why should I love him versus someone else? Get that um, distinction and um, the resistance can be met. Uh, another way we can get church um, um, apologetics in the church is for people to read their Bibles and to follow the Bible. Um, we've got to get, in my view, I mean, I've, I've been thinking about this for quite a while. How can we get this mandate? I mean, the Bible is, I mean, it's clear, and your shows have, have repeatedly mentioned that the, this is a mandate from God. Right. Right. Now, what I don't understand, I mean, no one debates that we should pray. No one debates whether or not we should evangelize. But we debate about apologetics. Why? Because we have been influenced by the bad philosophy we talked about the last episode. Why do we, why do we reject apologetics? Because we have non-Christian ideas in the church. We have to show this, the Christians that there's no reason to fear the skeptic. There's no reason to fear the agnostic. There's no reason to fear the atheist. We have answers. So we have answers, and, the, and God commands us to do to, um to give those answers. And then as church, churches start to see the value in it, we can then start hire, hiring someone to do the apologetics. Anyone in, that's involved in apologetics knows how much time it takes. Oh, I know. Our churches have um, family pastors. We have a pastor just for family matters. We have pastors for the youth. We have pastors for missions and evangelism. Okay. Why do we have pastors for these things? Because the church recognizes that these are the functions of the church. So if we see that the, the, one of the functions of the church is to defend the Christian faith on a rational level, then they should hire someone to have, to have that function, to train Christians to do that. And that would meet the problem of the formal training. Right. The, reason why we, well, the reason why Christians are struggling to give apologetics without formal training is because the church doesn't recognize it as being valuable. Yeah, and that, that's one of the things that disappointed me. Not only our church is not doing it, but I've even come across churches that resist it. And I find that mind baffling. I mean, how do you resist something that you're commanded to do? And I think maybe part of that is, is that you start getting into the head knowledge, then somehow you're diminishing a personal relationship, but that somehow your, your faith is weakened because if you have, if you have evidence, then somehow then there's no faith. Right, I mean, that's what we talked about last time is that that sees faith in conflict with one another. That as one increases, the one must decrease. That's just false. Right. That can be more false. We see in Romans 1 where Paul's talking about um, the human race having evidence, conclusive evidence, that God exists. 
reason has shown them, and what, what we mean by reason is they see the evidence and they make the correct inference. There is a creator God. That didn't diminish faith. That's what holds them accountable. And, if, and as, as an apologist, as a philosopher, I know that the more reason I use, the tougher faith gets. Why? Because I know what the truth is. And it calls, and the truth calls for me to give my life to it. It's easier to have this kind of, it's, it's easier to have faith. It's easier to be um, unfaithful and to f backslide not using your reason. Because the reason is God's instrument to find the truth. And the more you find the truth, the more convicting it gets. Just like in Romans 1. What they do? They didn't, the, the people in Romans 1 didn't use their reason to get rid of God. What did they do? They gave up reason. Hmm. They gave it up. Right. Well, how'd they give it up? They gave their lives over, they gave themselves to a lifestyle. That's what happened. And so the, 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 the irony is that the more you follow reason, the more you're going to find God. Yeah. To get rid of God, you've got to deny reason. And that's another thing that I wanted to mention is that there's this belief that, that in order to become a Christian, you have to sort of somehow give up reason. And my view is that, no, if you exercise your reason more fully, you will become a Christian. Because if you exercise your reason and look at the evidence, then the evidence will lead you to Christianity. It's the people who aren't exercising reason that we find in cults and mm -hmm. other religions because they are taking it on faith. They are not looking at the evidence. This is just some kind of, a, you know, a lot of times it's an emotional experience. A lot of times it may, there may be other reasons. But I'm convinced if people actually exercise their reason, the Christianity would be the only choice. The only choice, and then you'll see that their denial of Christianity wouldn't be rational. Right. Right, it's not going to be rational. The, the, the um, when you didn't, when you give up reason, um, that's the wrong thing to do. It's, it's irrational to be a, to be a non-Christian. Right. It's irrational. And so... Um, now, atheists wouldn't, you know, there are a lot of atheists who would argue with you on that. They were like... That, you know. That's a different show. Right, right. right, 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 right. <laughs> but I would say to the atheist, um, just real quickly, um, how do you account for reason if atheism is true? See, we're, the, the, um, the atheist thinks that we're going to follow reason as conclusion. The problem is atheism can't give a, a reason for reason. That's a good point. That's a very good point. We can talk about atheism. Yeah, I got a whole talk about you can do on atheism and skepticism on this line about the problem. But as it stands, um, I think there's a, there's a compelling argument to be made that at least, let's put it this way. The scripture is clear that if you're a Christian, this is the way it happens. Right. That reason leads us to God, doesn't take us away from God. And, and another thing is that if God gave us intellect, then why would he want us to overrule it when it came to making our the most important decision that there is to make, a decision about him, mm -hmm. coming to an understanding of him. It just doesn't make any sense that we're supposed to abandon this, this God-given reason, this reason that makes us in his image in the first place. Right. In any other area of life, any other avenue of life, any other decision we make, what do we do? We try to find the ra rational right. thing is to do. Right? We think, well, gosh, do I want to marry this person? I'll just take a blind leap of faith. I don't know who you are. I'm just going to do this. You know. Um, well, should I go in the stock market? Or should I put my money in this account? I, I don't care about the evidence. I'm just going to go on faith because that's the right thing to do. On these temporal um, decisions, we exercise reason all the time, right? Right. Now, why, how much more so on the, the most important question should we use our reason? I was listening to uh, the Bible Answer Man one time with Hank Handegraaff, and the guy called him up, and he said, uh, he said, Hank, he said, you know, I'm looking for a religion, and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to, you know, I want your advice on what, you know, what religion should I seek? Is Christianity, is that a good religion for me to, for me to belong to? <laughs> I mean, it was, like, it was like a matter of taste. It was like, okay, blueberry pie, you know, apple pie. It was like, he was talking about taste, you know. When he should have been looking at which religion is true, he's looking at what religion would I enjoy most. Which, which seems to be what he was saying. Right. Well, one, one, of the, one of the big reasons to do apologetics in the church today is so that not, we can actually clarify for the non-Christian the right questions they should be asking. So when the non-Christian comes and asks me, you know, like, for example, let's say someone like talking to Hank, well, sh should I pick Christianity for me? The apologist is going to clarify for the non-Christian the questions they should be asking. You're asking the wrong question. How do I know that? No, I mean, what's the right question? The question is, is Christianity true? Right. That's the question we should be asking. 
And um, one of the reasons why there's so much resistance in the church, and I'll be, be very blunt, um, because Christians aren't, for the most part, lots of Christians aren't very good at it. Um, one of the, um, when I was uh, talking to a student, and he said, I tried apologetics several times, and never got anywhere, so it's just not worth anything. And so I, I asked him, um, how did you, how'd you do apologetics? Were they, what were the answers that you gave? There were lousy answers. Um, I think one of the reasons why we're resistant, to the church is resistant to it, is because there aren't a whole lot of trained, it's kind of this catch-22, there aren't a whole lot of trained, well-trained apologists. Right. And so we need to start um, investing our time and money and, and train these guys and, um, to get the good, solid training and bring it back home. That's what I would say. I would say send someone to a, a, a school, get them trained, and bring them back. You're right, because when, when I go and talk, I've noticed that when I open the floor for questions and answers that people have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, people really do want to know. And sometimes they're a little afraid to ask because they're like, well, if I ask this question, and it, that may mean that I don't have faith. People, or someone else may think that I don't, ha I don't have faith. If I, if I question why is there evil, if I question, you know, how do we know there's a God? I can't let anyone know that I don't have any faith, so people be, are, are quiet about it. But people have questions, and, and, and we need to bring these questions out. And it's amazing how uh, emboldened you can become and fierce you can become when you think you've got answers. Right. Um, when I started doing apologetics and I started dialoguing with, with non-Christians and using the things I'd read in Geyser's books and William Lane Craig's books and things I had, tapes I had gotten, you can get tapes too, um, that I actually was answering the questions and winning the discussion. I thought, man. Christianity really is true. And all of a sudden, you're just like, you're, you're just ready to share with everyone. Right. When you have answers, you're willing to share with everyone. Why? Because you're not afraid anymore. Right, right, you, right. you really think that it's true. I mean, it's just all, all those things. Right. Yeah. Well, Jason Reed. Is that it? That's the end of another show. Okay. I thank you very much for coming. You're on. welcome. Thank you for having me. That will end this episode of Giving an Answer. Be sure to join me again next time. And until then, goodbye and God bless.